Okay, today we're going to read a story. Uh, just to recap, we recently read um, an, uh, a biography uh, called Community Hero, Chief Wilma Mankiller by Susanna Abbey. Today we're going to read an autobiography by um, Wilma Mankiller, um, and it's from Every Day is a New Day. Now, an autobiography is... Um, something that someone writes about themselves. The prefix auto means self. So an autobiography in this case is uh, something that Wilma wrote about her own life um, and her experiences similar to um, the memoir about Colin Powell that we just recently read. So uh, new location. Uh, we are in uh, my living room this time around. Um, so uh, my expectation is that you follow along pause the video at various points whenever I tell you to pause the video to answer questions and mark up the text. Remember, like I said, the reason why we mark up or annotate a text is because it helps you understand what you're reading so much better. I don't get graded on my annotations when I take college classes. However, I annotate all the time because I understand what I read better. And honestly, sometimes, I, I not like it's ever happened to any of you, but occasionally, I've been known to fall asleep while I'm reading. And you'll realize that if you take notes while you're reading, you're a lot less likely to fall asleep because it's keeping you alert and keeping you aware of what's going on. Okay, so follow along with me and let's get the show on the road. We're gonna start, uh, it's page 91 of our close reader book. Um, so the first thing I want you to do is we're gonna define those two terms on that page. Um, should be on your packet in front of you. The first one is indigenous, which means original. So you may have heard of the term indigenous people. Um, those are the people who originally lived in an area. And then the second one is sovereignty or self-rule or independence. Sovereignty means someone else isn't ruling over you. You have control over what happens. So right now, pause the video and write those two definitions down. Okay, uh, let's start reading along. Though I have lived most of my life on my grandfather's Cherokee land allotment in rural Adair County, Oklahoma, I learned a great deal about indigenous people, governance, and land during the 20 years I spent in the San Francisco Bay Area. Soon after, my Native American brothers and sisters joined the occupation of Alcatraz Island in late 1969, I made plans to visit the island. The morning I made the short journey to Alcatraz, my heart and mind made a quantum leap forward. Now, remember when we looked at the um, biography, um, we heard about this Alcatraz Island event. Um, so it sounds like we're gonna pick up right in the middle of that event and see what her experiences were from that event, from her perspective, okay? Lady Dawn descended on the nearly empty streets of Fisherman's Wharf, bearing the gift of a brand new day. Fishing boats rocked in their slips, awaiting the day's journey, as shop owners sleepily prepared for the onslaught of tourists. An occasional foghorn or the barking of a stray dog was the only sound other than the steady lap of the ocean against the docks. Alcatraz Island, several miles across San Francisco Bay, was barely visible as they boarded a boat for the former military and federal prison, which had recently been taken over by indigenous people and declared Indian Island. Mist and fog gave the island a dreamlike quality that seemed fitting for a place where the American dream was rejected and an indigenous dream declared. Now, I, this, I like her descriptions because they're so vivid. I just picture her, she's at the docks, she's looking across the water, and she sees Alcatraz Island, which used to be a prison, and she knows that the people um, indigenous to that area uh, claimed the island. They went on the island and took it over and said, you know what, this is ours, we're, we're, we're going to take this. The young students who occupied Alcatraz Island claimed that federal surplus land such as Alcatraz should be returned to tribal peoples on legal and moral ground, and that treaties, land rights, and tribal sovereignty should be respected and honored. This was not the first relationship between indigenous people and Alcatraz. 
long before Europeans arrived, Olones and other indigenous people of the coast rested and got their bearings on Alcatraz Island, called the island of the Pelicans, uh, Isla de los Alcatraz, after the seabirds that gathered there. Okay, right now what I want you to do is we're going to stop there. And I want you to, um, as you can see on your screen, as you read lines 1 to 41, we didn't quite get there yet, um, begin to collect and cite text evidence. So on page 91, in the margin, remember that's on the side of the page, I want you to make an inference about how Mankiller feels about her surroundings. Now an inference is an educated guess. Okay, so based on what we've read, I want you to make a prediction about how you think she feels about her surroundings. Think about how she describes things. Um, what, what, what does she, how does she feel about what's around her right now? Pause the video and in the margin, I want you to make an inference about her surroundings. Now I want you to underline descriptive language from page 91 that supports your inference. Descriptions that help show you that your inference is correct. So pause the video and underline descriptive language that supports your inference. Okay, page 92. We're going to start um, in the middle, third line down where it says, in the late 19th century. In the late 19th century, Modocs and other tribal people were imprisoned at Alcatraz for fighting the United States Army in a desperate attempt to retain their ancestral homelands. When the Spanish first settled in the mid-1700s on the land that is today California, there were more than 275,000 indigenous people living there. That changed very quickly. By 1900, fewer than 16,000 indigenous people remained. It is a miracle that even that many survived. Indigenous people of California endured widespread violence, starvation, disease, genocide, rape, and slavery. As late as 1870, a few communities in California were still paying bounties for Indian scalps or severed heads. Gross. 100 years later, the descendants of some of the indigenous people who survived the conquerors, miners, and settlers joined others at Alcatraz to find their bearings just as their ancestors had done so long ago. So, based on what we read here, I mean, they've been treated pretty, pretty terribly. Um, genocide, I don't know if you're familiar with that term, that means um, uh, killing people based on their raced in attempt to get rid of the race altogether. Um, so it sounds like they were viciously attacked. And over the course of uh, a little over 150 years, they went from 275,000 to 16,000 people. I mean, that's, that's a pretty significant drop. Right now in the margin, remember that's on the side of the page, uh, you can see underneath where it says close read notes. I want you to summarize the indigenous or original people's historical connection to Alcatraz. So all of this is like a little mini history lesson. What is their connection to Alcatraz Island? Okay, what was their experiences there? Just jot a few notes down. Pause the video. All right, on page 93, the first thing we're going to do again is we are going to define two terms. The first one is eclectic. Eclectic means assorted or diverse. Um, a lot of times you hear this uh, in regard to like an eclectic movie collection or a, an eclectic music collection. That means you have a wide range of top. I have a very eclectic music collection. I listen to everything you can possibly think of um, just because I get bored if I don't. Um, so that's what eclectic means, assorted or diverse. And then the next one is watershed, which is a turning point. And you hear this a lot when people say that was the watershed moment or in, in a case where it means that's like the turning point, like the watershed moment in a uh, 
in a game might be that um, the time that they scored the go-ahead run in the baseball game. That'd be the turning point of the game. And then all of a sudden they start scoring a lot of runs. Okay, so pause the video and write the definition of those two terms. Okay, so we're gonna start at the top of page 93. I visited Alcatraz several times during the 19th month, 19 month occupation of the island. So it's a long occupation. They were on there for over a year and a half. At any given time, the Alcatraz community was composed of an eclectic group of indigenous people, activists, civil rights veterans, students, and people who just wanted to be at a happening. Richard Oakes, a visionary young Mohawk who emerged as an early spokesman for the Alcatraz occupier, said, There are many old prophecies that speak of the younger people rising up and finding a way for the people to live. In their own languages, many tribes call themselves by words that mean the people. Notice the capital P. Alcatraz was a catalyst which means a starter for many young people who wanted, who would spend their lives forging a new path for the people. The Alcatraz experience was certainly a watershed for me, which was a turning point. The leaders articulated principles and ideas I had thought about, but could not name or articulate. During the Alcatraz occupation and that period of activism, anything seemed possible. Inspired by Alcatraz, I began a four-year association which, with the Pitt River Tribe, which was involved in a legal and political struggle to regain their ancestral lands near Mount Shasta. Mostly, I worked as a volunteer at the tribe's legal offices in San Francisco, but I frequently visited Pitt River lands where I learned about the history of indigenous people in California from traditional leaders. Occasionally, one of the leaders would bring out an old cardboard box filled with tribal documents supporting their land claims. They treated the precious documents almost as sacred objects. At Pitt River, I learned that sovereignty was more than a legal concept. It represents the ability of the people to articulate their own vision of the future, control their destiny, and watch over their lands. It means freedom and responsibility. Another place that had great impact on me was the Oakland Intertribal Friendship House, which was served as an oasis for a diverse group of indigenous people living in a busy urban area far from their home communities. We gathered there for dinners, meetings, and to listen to a wonderful array of speakers, including Tom Porter, a Mohawk leader who spoke about his people's fight to remain separate and independent. He explained the Mohawks' 1795 treaty with the United States provided that they had the perpetual right to live on their reservations in independent sovereignty, never to be disturbed. He spoke movingly about the important role women play among his people. He said that traditional Iroquois women selected the chiefs and could depose of them if they did not perform their duties properly. The speech had a powerful, lasting impact on me. So she talks about a lot of different events here. She talks about uh, when she went and visited Alcatraz. She talked about uh, her work with the uh, Pitt River Indian tribe, um, trying to get them their land back. Um, and, and what really sticks with me here is this idea of sovereignty. This idea that you have control over your actions or your people's actions. And I know a lot of you guys feel that in school. You feel like you want sovereignty or control over your actions. And in some ways you do. Um, you have more sovereignty over your actions at school than you did in elementary school. But there are still people telling you what to do. And sometimes that frustrates you. Well, these people were getting frustrated too because it would be like if you were sitting at home in your room and all of a sudden, you know, someone walks in and decides, you know what? I kind of like that bed. That bed is mine now. And I'm going to go and take it. And you know what? You can stay there if you want, but I'm going to kind of make some rules about the bed. And um, yeah, whenever I'm done letting you sit on it, you're going to have to move and you can't come back. 
Um, so, I mean, I could see where they'd be upset about this. Right now, what I want you to do is I want you to do two things. First, you need to underline sentences that explain what Alcatraz symbolized for younger American Indians. Okay, that's going to be at the top of page 93, um, those first two paragraphs. What did it symbolize for younger American Indians? What did it represent? Um, there's a couple of spots where it talks about the people. Well, what, what did it mean to the people? The second thing I want you to do is um, the second bullet down. Circle two pieces of information that Mankiller learns about sovereignty. Remember, she talked about sovereignty, this idea that you have ownership and control over your actions. Um, and other people aren't telling you what to do. Circle two pieces of information where Mankiller talks about that. Okay. So right now, I want you to pause the video and do those two things. On page 94, before we move on, we are going to pause the video and write the definition of these two words. The first one is depose. Depose means to overthrow or remove. So if you look in the line, he said that traditional Iroquois women selected the chiefs and could depose of them or could get rid of them. And the second one is galvanize. Galvanize means to excite or inspire. So if you are galvanized, you're, you're like wound up, you're like ready to go. Okay, a, a, a coach might galvanize you or in, ex, inspire you to want to go play your best at the game. So pause the video and write down those two definitions. And we are going to start on page 80 or line 82. My experiences at Alcatraz and Pitt River led me to confound, co-found with Joe Carrillo, California Indians for a Fair Settlement, which encouraged California tribal people to reject a proposed settlement of all land claims for only pennies per acre. All this work helped me to understand more fully the historical context in which tribal people live our contemporary lives. So this section right here is talking about um, she, so she started this group, the California Indians for a Fair Settlement, um, which encouraged California people, the, the tribal people, to reject this idea. So the, the U.S. government would come to them and say, hey, um, I know your land is worth $5 per acre, um, but we'll give you 15 cents and we're going to call it good. And she encouraged people to argue against them and say, no, that's not going to happen. That's not fair. It's worth $5. We should get $5, not 15 cents. Okay. And I just made that number up. I'm not really sure um, what the number is specifically. Um, but right now I want you to answer question number eight on your page. There are lines for you to write it. You need to summarize what Mankiller learns from her work at Alcatraz with the Pitt River Tribe. Okay. Remember that was... Uh, on page 93, where she talked about her work with the Pitt River Tribe. It's the second paragraph down, starting in line 53. And then I want you to... Um, sorry, what she learns from Alcatraz, which is the first paragraph. What she learns about the Pitt River Tribe, which is the second paragraph. And then what she learned in Oakland, which is the third paragraph. And then what did her experiences teach her? Support your answer with explicit textual evidence. So make sure you give specific examples. What did this teach her? Okay. So just write down a few things that this you think this taught her. Um, about sovereignty, about this idea that um, it's okay to fight back. Um, notice she's not saying physically fight. She's saying she used... Um, legal documents to try to argue and win the land back for the people. Okay, so pause the video here to answer that question. Page 95. Actually, we're going to start at the bottom of page 94. In 1976, I was further galvanized by a treaty conference at the Standing Rock Sioux Reservation in Wakpala, South Dakota. That readied delegates for the 1977 United Nations Conference 
on indigenous rights in Geneva. I had been working as a volunteer to help indigenous people prepare for the Geneva Conference by documenting the fact that from the time of initial contact with Europeans, tribal communities were treated as separate nations and numerous agreements between the emerging United States and tribal nations were signed. So there's this big conference in Geneva and um, what she's preparing for is she's showing documentation that says that the U.S. government made all these agreements with the indigenous people. They made contracts that said this is what's going to happen. Okay. Now the U.S. government didn't live up to those promises. And that's the point she's going to try to make. At Wak Wakpala, tribal sovereignty was framed as an issue of international significance. The concept of self-determination in international law, as defined by UN General Assembly Resolution 1514, resonates with indigenous people. Now listen to this quote. I know that's a, that big chunk right there is um, kind of confusing, but it all winds down to this quote. All peoples have the right to self-determination. By virtue of that right, they freely determine their political status and freely pursue their economic, social, and cultural development. What that means by self-determination is it means that they have the right to decide what is going to happen to their people. Okay, So the U.S. government shouldn't be allowed to control what they do. They are their own collective of people, um, their own um, group, and they shouldn't have to abide by the laws of the U.S. government. They should be able to control themselves um, as they see fit because the, all these agreements were made that they would share the land with the U.S. as long as the U.S. left them to be their own, basically like their own country almost. They had their own rules, their own rights. All right, next paragraph down. During this time, I also came to understand that among some tribal people, including the Cherokee, there was a historical period where there was little separation between political and spiritual organizations. Cherokee spiritual leaders were involved in conducting the council meetings that provided some of the political structure whereby major decisions were made by the entire settlement. Council meetings were often held after or during ceremonies, which helped prepare the people to deal with major issues affecting the community. However, in contemporary times, there is a formal separation between the political organization and spiritual practitioners. So what this is talking about, it's saying that um, their leaders were oftentimes their spiritual leaders also. And so a lot of their political activities would happen after religious ceremonies. Um, but now in present day, they're more separated. All right. Um, in this section... I want you to underline the relationship between political and spiritual organizations in the present and the past, which is what I just talked about. It's the last paragraph on page 95. Underline what the political and spiritual organizations are like in the present and what they're like in the past. You're going to underline two things. Pause the video while you do that. All right, almost done. Page 96. The Alcatraz, Pitt River, California Indian for a Fair Settlement, and the Treaty Conference experiences were great preparation for my future role as Principal Chief of the Cherokee Nation. Now, what I like most about her is she had all of these different experiences, and she includes how those helped shape who she is today. Okay, Each one, she talks about her experiences on Alcatraz, her experiences with the Pitt River tribe, her experiences with the um, California Indian for a fair settlement where she is trying to convince people to um, reject the government's uh, proposals and her preparation for the treaty conference. All of that helps shape who she is. Now here's an important thing for any, bleh, 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 bleh. here's an important thing I want you to do. I want you to skip question number 10 because I want you to spend some time on the short response question. The short response question. I want you to make sure to cite textual evidence in your response, including line numbers. I know it's tricky, but
but I want you to support whatever point it is you're trying to make. This is the question. In what ways is Wilma Mankiller's autobiographical account of her life different from Susanna Abbey's biography? Compare and contrast the information presented in each text, review your reading notes for both texts, and make sure to cite text evidence in your response, including line numbers. Basically what this is saying is you're just comparing the two things we read. We're comparing the thing we read a couple of days ago, the uh, biography, to her autobiography. Now I don't see as many major differences as we did in the Colin Powell articles, but there were some differences. Okay, So how do these two documents compare to each other? What were the focus of each one? Okay. So make sure you completely answer that question on this page. If you need to go to an additional page, that is fine as well. All right, good luck. Completely answer all the questions. You guys are awesome. Keep it up.